You're listening to a message by Pastor Scott Hogue at Cornerstone Community Church in Manteca, California. For more information on the church and what's happening here, visit cornerstonemanteca.com. This morning we're continuing our series called The Miracle of Mercy. Today is part four. We're looking at another side of mercy, how you deal with difficult people. How do you deal with difficult people? How do you deal with that person that drives you absolutely crazy? How do you deal with that person that drives you nuts? Uh, people that are ignorant, people that are uninformed, people that um, are rude or disrespectful or just plain mean, right? Some of you say, well, pastor, that person's sitting right next to me today. <laughs> Don't look at them, all right? Don't look at them. Have you ever thought that God put those people in your life, those irritating people in your life to help shape you? to help you become the man of God or the woman of God that he wants you to be. So for whatever reason, these difficult people that are always in our lives, they may be part of our family or the people that we work with, they need a little bit more grace than other people. Amen? We run into them all the time. These are the people that drive way too slow in the fast lane. These are the people that drive when they're, and they're texting while they're driving or they're eating a Big Mac while they're driving and, and you're nudging somebody now. It's the irritating people. The, the person that's on the other end of the line where you're calling Verizon or AT&T and they're incompetent and they're not understanding what you need. It's those kind of people. The other type of difficult people are the people that are just plain mean, rude, the ones that never say thank you, the ones that, that are snotty, they're negative, they always see the, the glass half empty, they're, they're pessimistic, they're not happy people, and they always want to tell you what's bad about what you're doing, not what's good about what you're doing. How many of you know somebody like that? You don't have to raise your hand, but yeah, we, we all do. We know people. It's that difficult person. How in the world are you supposed to show mercy to those kind of people that are so weird and, and irritating and they bug you to death? And when all you really want to do inside of us is we want to take our hand and we want to slap them. The Bible tells us or gives us some very practical ways on how we are supposed to show mercy to difficult people and how we're supposed to have patience. And so I've got six of them, and some of you uh, were fortunate to get a bulletin. Inside the bulletin, there are some sermon notes. Unfortunately, I don't think we have any of those left, but we'll make sure we get some of those more next week. But um, inside your bulletin, I'm going to give you six, six different um, suggestions or tips from the Bible on how you are to treat people that are difficult in your life. The first one is this. Look behind their behavior. Look behind their behavior. Now remember this, and I've said it before, that hurting people hurt people. If someone's dealing with something, if someone's hurt because of a situation in their life, more, uh, they're more apt to hurt on the outside. They're more apt to hurt you. It's important to ask ourselves when a situation comes, to ask ourselves what's going on here, and to look, to look behind their behavior. What's going on here? Did they just have a fight with their husband or wife? Did, did they lose somebody? Uh, are they grieving? Did, did something happen in their job? Did they lose their job? Maybe they don't have enough money to pay the bills this month. I don't know. You know, it's so, it's so true that it's, it's so hard to be positive when you feel so negative inside. It's hard to feel really good when you feel really bad inside, when your health is not good, when, when you just got news from the doctor. It's hard to be positive. It's hard to be positive when you've just looked at your bank account and, and the money's not there. So there's lots of reasons. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 12. It's on your notes and it's on the screen. When a fool is annoyed, he quickly lets it, lets it be known. Smart people will ignore an insult. Why is it wise to ignore an insult? Why don't wise people get irritated with someone who's uh, irritating? It's because they look past their behavior. They look past their, their, the situation and they, they look to their pain. Here's the second suggestion from God's word. It's number two, refuse to be offended. Refuse to be offended. Now we're talking about a choice here. You and I have a choice. When something happens to us, when someone says something to us, we have a choice not to be offended. 
It's up to you. It's not up to the other person. I'm going to say this, and some of you might want to write this down. It's not on the screen, but your emotional and spiritual maturity is oftentimes measured on how you treat people that mistreat you. Your emotional, I'm going to say it again, your emotional and spiritual maturity is measured on how you treat people that mistreat you. Do you try to get even with someone when someone insults you? When someone says smack to you, do you want to, are you thinking of something to say right back to them? Do you want to insult them back? You know, when someone says, you know, you, you make me so mad. You make me so mad. You know what's happening then? Is you are allowing that person that made you mad to control you. They're controlling you and they're controlling your emotions. You make me mad. When you say that, you're saying, I'm not in control of my emotions. What I'm saying is, you are in control of my emotions. And at that moment, what you've done is, is you've given up that control. You're allowing them to take control, and you lose control. And when you lose control, it often has an effect on your tongue. Your tongue. And when you start lashing out with your tongue, all hell breaks loose. Amen? I mean, it's all over. The Bible tells us this in Proverbs 21. Watch your words and hold your tongue. Hold your tongue. You'll save yourself a lot of grief. So when it comes to relationships, guys, don't be so easily offended. Learn to get over it. Don't make it a big deal. Walk away from it. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Proverbs 16 says, better to be patient than powerful. Better to have self-control than to conquer a city. When you can control yourself, when someone is irritating you, when somebody is insulting you, even on social media, amen, when you decide to control yourself, you've got greater power than a general who just took over a city, who conquered a city. So this should be our prayer. This should be my prayer. God, give me a tender heart and a tough hide. Give me a tender heart and a tough hide. You know, most of the time we are the exact opposite, aren't we? We have such thin skin and we've got a tough, tough heart. God wants us to have tender hearts. God wants us to be like himself because that's who he is. He, he's tender. He's tender. He's merciful towards people. The minute that we make the choice to participate in an offense, that's when our mercy level goes down. Doesn't it? You know what I'm talking about. Proverbs 19, look at that. A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. It's to one's glory. Isn't that awesome? That's so cool. It's to, one's, it's to one's glory to overlook an offense. God says that when you overlook an offense, it's going to bring glory to yourself. Again, it, it's so much easier to show mercy to someone um, uh, who, is, who is kind, right? But it's so difficult to show mercy when they're irritating you. But the thing is, is we've got to look past that. We've got to look into their background. What is making them so angry? What's making them so ticked off? What's making them so rude? What's making them be so negative? Look at their background. Friends, as believers in Christ, we've got to be wise. Amen? We've got to be smart. We've got to understand. We've got to look past that offense and to the background. What's going on here? So that we can get over it. So we can get over the offense. Here's a third suggestion, number three, cut them some slack. Cut them some slack. That means be gracious to them. Show them mercy. Listen, everybody has bad days. Some of you might be having a bad day this morning, I don't know. But we all have bad days. We have days where we wake up and it's like, it's not a good day. And you feel cranky, you feel irritated, all right? Cut people some slack. If you're that way, don't you know other people have those days as well? Let me tell you a little, a little something in, in our lives, in my life. You know, Michelle, after, after my, my wife, she, she knows I preach every Sunday morning, you know, two times on Sunday morning. On Saturdays, 
I'm pretty stressed. I mean, honestly, I'm, I, I get, I get uh, kind of anxious about Sunday morning. I'm, I'm preparing, I'm getting stuff ready. And she, she cuts me some slack. She knows that I'm that way. I mean, after how many years, you know, she, she understands that I need some space. I need to go and study. And she lets me come down to the church sometimes for five or six hours. I'm down here on a Saturday morning when, when she's taking care of the kids and she's doing this and that and getting stuff ready. I mean, it, it, she cuts me some slack. And that's important. And it's, it's important that we understand that we need to do that with people. The Bible tells us in Ephesians to be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. If you're a loving person, if you're a compassionate person and a merciful person, you're going to say, I'm going to make some allowances for you. I'm going to cut you some slack here, okay, because you love them. Uh, people ask me all the time, Pastor, give me some good advice for a marriage. We're just now starting out. Give me some good advice. This is great advice here. Make allowances for each other's faults because you love them. Because you love them so much, you make allowances for them. James tells us this, the man who makes no allowances for others will find none made for him. If you, want, if you want someone to cut you some slack when you're having a bad day or you, can, you have some issues going on, it's better that you cut people slack now so that they'll cut slack for you. Jesus said this, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. They'll be shown mercy. Let me interject this thought. You know, not everyone who, who bugs you or irritates you uh, uh, hurts you, they, they, they don't really realize that it bothers you. A lot of times they don't. Oftentimes they're just reacting because of a situation that happened. They're raising their voice, they're yelling, they're screaming, they're, they're doing stuff, they're, they're making motions with their hand. It, it, they're upset, obviously they're upset, but, but most of the time it's not because they're upset at you, they're upset about the situation of something that has happened in their life. Sometimes they don't even know that, that you're irritated or that you're bothered by it. So what do you do? You've got to remember what Jesus did. Paul told us in Colossians, Colossians 3, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Here's the fourth suggestion from God's Word. Refuse to gossip about them. <laughs> refuse to gossip about it. It's so hard, isn't it? I mean, when somebody hurts your feelings and you're, you, you, you're just so upset and so ticked off, in our flesh, we want to go and tell somebody. I mean, we immediately go to our phones, you know? We go to our phones, we start texting somebody, oh, call me back in 10 minutes, and you're, you're all excited about it, and, and we need somebody. We think we need somebody at that point to agree with us. we got to get somebody that we can talk to and say, you know, that guy's such a loser, that girl's such an idiot, you know, whatever. And we want to tell somebody about it. We get so much satisfaction with that, don't we? I mean, come on, guys, let's be honest. We get so much satisfaction. It feels so good to be able to get it off of our chest and to talk to somebody about what happened. I want to drop a bomb on you right now and tell you that that kind of attitude is not biblical. It's not. It might be okay in our culture. The world might say, oh, that's fine. You deserve, you need to get off your chest. You need to talk to somebody, that irritating, that irritated person, whatever, whoever that is that hurts you. Guys, that's not showing mercy. It's showing that you are basically spiritually immature and that all you are is being selfish. Look at Proverbs 17. Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. Forgiveness, I've said it before, is so powerful. The power of forgiveness, when you are able to release somebody, it's powerful. The Bible tells us that it preserves love. But when you take that bait, when you take that offense, and you bring it into yourself, and you gossip about it, you choose to talk about it, what it does is it destroys relationships. Proverbs 
26 tells us, without wood, a fire goes out. Without a, without a gossip, a quarrel dies down. Gossip, all it does is fuel the fire. But we don't care, do we? We don't care that it fuels a fire. Bring it on. Let's talk about it. Let's make a big old bonfire. Let's talk. Guys, that is not acting like Christ. That is not what Jesus would do. Jesus is all about mercy. And a part of that is to refuse to gossip. You know what gossip is? I mean, really, if you look at it, gossip is all about retaliation. No, it's not, Pastor. Yes, it is. It's all about retaliation. What you're really doing is, is you're trying to get back at that person. You get back at that person by talking about that person to somebody else. And oftentimes that person that you're talking to, they're not even involved. And half the time they don't even care what you're talking about. But it makes you feel good. Why? Because you're retaliating. You're talking about it. Would Jesus do that? Really, would Jesus do that? Of course Jesus would not do that. The Bible says that God hates gossip. Why do you think God hates gossip so much? It's because gossip destroys. Gossip ruins people. It rips people up. It kills people. In fact, in Romans, Paul puts gossip right next to murder. Some things that God hates. Why? It's because gossip kills someone's reputation. It kills someone's character. Gossip, I've seen it so many times, gossip ruins families. It separates families. I've seen businesses shut down because of gossip and slander. I've seen churches close their doors because of gossip. Did you know that God gets angry when we gossip? God does not want his people to be involved in gossip and slandering other people. I don't know about you, but I don't want to make God angry. Friends, God's want, God wants to bless us. God wants to give us peace. God wants to give us joy. God wants to give us good health. But when we involve ourselves in the crud of offense and bitterness and, and talk about it and spread it and cause dissension, that is not of God. That is what the enemy wants. The enemy wants to divide families. The enemy wants to divide churches. The enemy wants to destroy. He has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. But God in Jesus Christ has come to give us life and life more abundantly. That's why in Philippians, Paul was so adamant when he was talking to the church and telling them, you've got to get your thinking right. You've got to get what you're saying right. Listen, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard of me or seen in me, Paul says, put it into practice. And then the result is this, and the God of peace will be with you. Peace. Isn't that something that we all really want? We want peace. We don't want chaos. We want our homes to be filled with peace. We want our marriages to be filled with peace. Here's another way, key way to show mercy. Refuse to play their game. Refuse to play their game. These difficult people, these people that you're irritated with, these people that hurt you, guys, they love to argue. They love to debate. They want to get your attention. They're going to do anything to throw the hook out at you because they want you to get your focus on this thing. They want to get your attention. And all they actually want to do is control you. Listen, they don't care what you think. Happens all the time on social media, on Facebook. Somebody makes a stupid post, you know, you read that, you're like, oh my word, I can't believe they wrote that. Do they really believe that? Oh my goodness, and we let it bother us. And then the next step is we, we look at it, we're like, I'm going to set them straight. 
I'm going to go on my, uh, underneath, I'm going to comment on it, and I'm, uh, oh, I'm ready for this. Are you ready for this? I hope they read this, because I'm going I'm to lay it out. I'm going to set them straight, and we're typing, and we imagine them reading it. Ooh, this is going to be good. Don't do it. It's a trap. It's a trap. What you need to do is walk away from your computer. Walk away from that situation. Listen, guys, you're not showing weakness by walking away. You're actually showing strength. Look at Proverbs 26. Just as charcoal and wood keep a fire going, a quarrelsome person keeps an argument going. Don't get hooked on that. Don't dive into that. These difficult people, they find their value and their purpose in getting you upset. Don't get involved with it. Don't play their game. Walk away. You see, here's the thing. Sometimes the most merciful thing you could ever do is, is, is just to walk away from an argument. Really? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've got to put my foot down. I've got to tell them what for, Pastor. I mean, I've got to set them straight. Really, all you're doing is you're causing yourself to be angry and frustrated and bitter, and, 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 and really, at the end of the day, that difficult person has won the day. Here's the final thing. Number six, take the higher ground. Always do the right thing, whether they do it or not. If they insult you, if they're talking smack about you, if they're saying rude things to you, you are to treat them with kindness. Pastor, this is a really difficult message. I don't know. Did you get this out of the Bible, Pastor? <laughs> if they're slow to show you patience, then you treat them with kindness. Listen, guys, you cannot control what other people do to you or say to you, but you can control what you say and do to them. Don't let them control you. Am I going to be a patient person or an impatient person? Am I going to be a merciful person or an unmerciful person? Guys, it's your choice. You can't control what people are going to say and do to you, but you can control what you do to them. And I'm telling you that if you will just take the higher ground, if you will obey God's word and you take the higher ground, you are going to have a greater perspective of what's happening in that situation. You're going to be able to see beyond their pain. You're going to be able to see their background. You're going to be able to see what's really going on behind this behavior that they're displaying right now. Some of you might think, you know, I've got every right, Pastor. When somebody does that to me, I've got every right to retaliate against them. Let me show you what the Bible says here in James chapter 2. It says, mercy, we, we went over this last week, mercy triumphs over judgment. Do you understand how powerful mercy is? Mercy is so powerful, more powerful than judging. You might have the greatest comeback. Somebody insults you, and you're thinking in your head, ooh, I can't wait to say what I'm going to say. You might have the greatest comeback to that person who just insulted you, but let me remind you that mercy is greater. Mercy is greater. The Bible tells us, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. If you will take your Bible, if you will obey the word of God, friends, you will always be blessed. When you obey God's word, and people ask me all the time, or they tell me all the time, Pastor, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Christ. You know, the most Christ-like thing that you could do is this, is, is not to retaliate. And I know it's hard. That's hard for me. I can remember years ago, there was a family that was so upset with me for whatever reason. And they tried so hard to get under my skin. They would talk about me behind my back. And it was painful. Isn't it painful when someone is so rude to you and they talk about you and they, they, they spread lies about you and they gossip? It's so painful, isn't it? But I refused 
to participate in that. I refuse to come back at them. I refuse to say anything negative about that family. In fact, I would say positive things about that family, hoping that they would hear it, hoping that it would get back to them. It's not easy. It's not easy when someone is like that. It's easy to be positive. It's easy to be kind and treat people with mercy when, when they're treating you with kindness. But it's very difficult when they're hurting you. Friends, we are called to be like Christ. We're called to be like him because he is merciful. The Bible tells us in Colossians, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Above all, clothe yourself with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony. You think about that. Well, how do I clothe myself? Because that sounds really good, Pastor. How do I clothe myself in mercy? How do I become like that? Clothe myself with kindness and patience. How do I do that? It means that you need to practice it. I clothe myself by taking little steps. I practice it. I do it. And the more that I do it, the more that I display mercy, that's who I'm going to become. I'm going to become a merciful person. I'm going to become a kind person. But it takes practice. I clothe myself in it. As we close this message, I'm going to close with these last three verses that are on your sermon notes there. They're found in, in Romans, in Romans chapter 12. And the first one is this. It's found in verse 14. It says, ask God to bless those who persecute you. Yes, ask him to bless not curse. Ask him to bless, not curse. When was the last time you prayed for somebody that, that irritates you? When was the last time you prayed for somebody that, that insulted you? Ask God to bless them. This is what mercy is. This is the miracle of mercy. I don't know how I can do that, but God helps us to do it. It's the miracle of mercy. God will help us when we pray for them, that I won't judge them. I'm not going to pray this for God, punish them. God, make something bad happen to them because of what they did to me. No, I'm going to pray blessing over their life. Look at verses 17 and 18. If someone has done you wrong, don't repay him with a wrong. Try to do what everyone considers to be good. Do everything possible on your part to live in peace with everyone. And the final verse is this. Verse 21, do not let evil defeat you. Instead, conquer it with good. This is the way of mercy. This is the way of Christ. How many you consider yourself a follower of Jesus today? You, you consider yourself a follower of Christ? Let me see your hand. You, you, you're here today. You're a follower of Jesus. You're proud to be a Christian today. Listen. As a believer, as a Christ follower, you and I are supposed to act like Jesus. We're not supposed to live like the world. How many would, would pray alongside of me, God, I need to be a more merciful person, and I'm willing to let you build that in my life. I'm, I'm willing to, I want to be a more merciful person. Let me see your hands. Come on, let me see. I want to be a more merciful person. Let me see your hands. I want to be a more merciful person. Okay, put them down. Guess what? If that is your prayer, we're going to pray this prayer at the end. God is going to test you. God's going to put somebody in your path. It might be right when you leave church, when you're in the parking lot. Somebody may irritate you so bad, I don't know, but God is going to put something in your path this week to test you. Will you be a, a merciful person or an unmerciful person? When they irritate you, are you going to run to so-and-so and, -so and talk about that person and, and gossip about them? What are you going to do? Are you going to play their game? Are you going to get on board with it? Are you going to come back with a good comeback? Let's stand together and let's pray. God, here we are. Lord, we are your people. We are Christ followers. And Lord, we know that that means a whole lot, but really it, it means that we love you and we want to obey you. We want to do what you tell us to do. We want to act like Jesus. And so, God, this week, this week, give us opportunity. Let mercy triumph over judgment this week. Help us to understand that mercy and forgiveness is so powerful. Lord, we give you our hearts this week. 
Be with every family in this room. Protect them on all sides. Every marriage, we push back the forces of the evil one. Now in the name of Jesus, we declare the authority of Jesus to reign in every household. Lord, we commit ourselves to walk in purity, to walk in your ways. We thank you, Lord, for our children and our grandchildren. Protect them on all sides, God. Lord, at the end of every day, at the end of this week, God, we will thank you for your faithfulness. You are a good God, a wonderful God, and a merciful God. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.